What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, giving you another week of what's going on in pop culture. My name is Pat Sheehan, joined by my trusty co-host, Dave Martin Swagger. Dave, how was your uh, Blackpink weekend? Oh, tremendous. Absolutely <laughs> tremendous weekend. Love to have uh, our favorite Korean ladies back in our lives. Very excited to talk about the record. Dave, would you say that you were uh, born pink? Yeah, for sure. Actually, no, you know, I wouldn't say that. I, I wouldn't consider myself born pink. It's more like I was converted to pink. You know, it's ah. like, you know, became a blink over time. Wow. As, you, as it goes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think that makes sense. Uh, anyways, as, as we're talking about Blackpink dropped an album, we're going to be talking about that, as well as a few other albums, some TV shows, and a movie. So hit that subscribe on YouTube.com slash NostalgiaPod or go to our Twitter at NostalgiaPod and follow the link tree to hear the podcast any way you'd prefer. Also, share us with friends. It's always nice. Anyways, let's jump right into the music, Dave. But we're going to be starting in a different part of K-pop. And that's NCT 127. One of the, the subunits of the NCT boy group, boy band, boy group. Um, from uh, is, Are they SM Entertainment? Actually, yes. From, yes. Yeah, sure, so. Surely <laughs> YG yeah, wouldn't I, release against Blackpink. But SM right. was like, fuck it. Let's send one <laughs> of our most popular acts in the U.S. head to head with Blackpink. Bold move. And so uh, their their fourth album, Two Baddies, comes out. Uh, like you said, opposite Blackpink. Do you feel like like this album had the juice to go toe to toe with Blackpink? Yeah, I, I think ultimately uh, it's they're very different appeals, and kind of speaks to when other genres release stuff head to head. There's room for both, and I think that's that's surely the case for fans of both of these groups that like both, but. Yeah, I, I think NCT One Two Seven uh, kind of exists in a very separate lane from Blackpink for all intents and purposes, and I was definitely interested interested in hearing this album because I because we hadn't talked about NCT One Two Seven specifically to this point. Uh, we've actually kind of been slacking on covering NCT because they just release so much music across their various uh, subunits. We talked about the Wavy album, and we talked about NCT dreams first album but that means in that time we missed a main nct album we missed a second nct dream album and we missed nct 127's last album 11 months ago alas finally uh jumping in on this and i think it more or less lives up to the reputation that they hold which why i think they kind of exist in their own little pocket of k-pop and they're very popular obviously which is that they like to experiment a lot with mm. their sounds and their genres. And you definitely hear that on Four Baddies. There's all kinds of tracks on this. Yeah, you know, as you're listening through, at times it sounds like super futuristic and like hyper poppy. At other times it sounds more traditional, like R&B. And even other times, like just more toned down, like sing-songy pop. And uh, I, I think that that genre... Uh, spanning type of album actually worked really well to like hold my attention throughout. Um, I think as we've talked about with some of the other uh, K-pop groups, there can be a sameness, especially if the production of the songs tends to kind of fall in, in a similar realm. But this really had you guessing from song to song. I think that worked out really well. I do. I do have to say for my own taste, uh, the more like traditional, like, R&B pop sounding songs or just more traditional pop sounding songs didn't grab me as much. But there's a few tracks, especially near the beginning, that are like pretty futuristic and like really inventive with the production and, and like the, the different like flair and, and like ways that they bring vocals in and out that I just thought were like really inventive and really interesting to listen to. When it when it got more traditional, it was almost like disappointing i was like Let, let's go back to that i want to hear more of that so uh pretty interesting album to listen to what did you think of uh two baddies <laughs> i mean who among us two doesn't baddies. want both two baddies and one <laughs> porsche right yeah. <laughs> very relatable now i think for the title track that one's all right because i think ultimately like that chorus is pretty corny <laughs> yeah but you know, the rapping i think is actually pretty solid and i think um the faces of NCT One Two Seven, uh, Taeyong and Mark, who I know most, most mostly because of their inclusion in Super M, the SM supergroup, 
I feel like they really carry that track, and I like NCT 127's hip hop because you know nine member group they they usually have a lot of the dudes rapping when they have some rap, you know, and I think that's pretty fun just to kind of hear all the different vocals on there. But um, I think Two Baddies is it, it it can be like a little grating with that with that chorus. Yeah, and it's too bad too because I really I really like the like horns with like the really deep like vibrating bass around it. I think that's actually a really great lead in um to the chorus. But yeah, the chorus is just kind of like oh uh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, but it, I think overall the track is like okay. Um, I actually liked faster the first track. Mm-hmm. First of all, anytime you're gonna start off a track with a falcon screech at the beginning, I'm like already in. But then like the the like toned down like production with just like heavy heavy um percussion and bass to it just really sucked right. me in and i think they mm-hmm. blow over it like really well and they really trade back and forth beautifully there's a lot of chemistry between them i think it's pretty obvious yeah totally i think the way that bass really builds that bass line is really strong and yeah it's a good fit for them it's more in line i think with their like traditional like nct brand that kind of song um but you know i, I was a bit struck by just a bunch of these songs have really catchy choruses or hooks. You know, I think just the, the vocal performance on some of these songs I really do enjoy. I thought uh, you speaking to the beginning still, time lapse, um, mm-hmm. the harmony on that chorus, the can we fix it or fix it part, I think is very catchy. Love that one. Um, but then later on, songs like Black Clouds, another catchy chorus, um, Playback in particular, another catchy chorus. So even if like some of the songs I might like just gravitate towards some of those moments, I think it all sounds really good when you have like these harmonized vocal performances kind of layered on top of each other on these sticky, catchy choruses. Yeah, I, I think they definitely thrive off the harmonies and just like the, like you said, the way that they can kind of suck you in and just kind of go back to these choruses that just get yeah earwormy uh i i think for me though like as i was going throughout the album a song like tasty really stands out because (laughs) it's just so unique in terms of like the tempo that they're going for and when they really bring that energy and also they start to do some of these like vocal distortions to the the track it really (laughs) just like it really surprised me but i was like yeah like i I like that they're going for it here and i thought it was pretty good i hear you laughing what with, I thought with, Tasty yeah. had some of the, one, probably the funniest like vocal delivery. It's uh Johnny first, then someone else later. It's a uh, we're savage outlaws, rock <laughs> solid, no flaws, and it's like done intentionally monotone. I thought that was so funny. Yeah, there's also another point where they're like so tasty, and I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. It's it is pretty great. Um, yeah, I think overall though, like NCT one two seven. For, for my first listen, I was really impressed. Uh, and I, I think that, like you said, they put out so much music, but you can see why people want to get so much music from them because they're mm-hmm. going all over the map and it, it's all pretty interesting. So any final thoughts? Are you ready to move on to some rock music, Dave? <laughs> no, I, I'm curious to see how this one does. It's the fourth NCT 127 album. And NCT 127 is easily the most popular version of NCT in the U.S. And I'd like to see just how far they can go with that as we've talked about k-pop's growing uh acceptance and and dominance in the u.s so more to come for sure more to come for sure uh follow our nostalgia best of 2022 playlist to hear all the songs we've enjoyed this year like i said we're gonna switch it up to some rock music now we're gonna be talking about the beths who dropped their third album expert in a dying field those uh witty witty alt rockers with their fascinating titles and you know spunky lines but it's it's funny because the best as a group are uh, one that we were on pretty early uh with future me hates me back in 2018 and then jump rope gazers in 2020 was a bit of a letdown for us you know and and i think coming into expert in a dying field i didn't really know what to expect i i was like are we going to kind of get more of the kind of going back to the same well but not as interesting or as like biting lyrically or are we gonna get something new and i i think we got a little bit of something in the middle i think that we got a bit of a return to form for them 
but also I think uh, they didn't really do a lot to like change things up, but just kind of expanded upon their their lyricism and I think their song crafting in this one, but kind of leveled up. What did you think of Expert in a Dying Field, Dave? Yeah, I, I agree with that a lot. I think ultimately it has what fans of the best have gravitated towards thus far, which is just really strong, confident storytelling from Elizabeth Stokes. And I think this time around, the the guitar work and the general tempo of the album is just more lively and uplifting like that first album, less like that second album. And that's why I like it uh, a lot more than Jumper Up Gazers. I think there is a bit of a variety, though. You know, they, they do kind of jump around in how they do their their songs. But ultimately, like that constant of Stokes's vocals is like probably the best thing about the band and seems to always be there, especially on their best songs. So, yeah, I like this one quite a bit. And I, I think the, the title is honestly hilarious, you know. <laughs> Yeah, speaking to rock music in that way i I completely agree and you know speaking to your point about the guitar work i think upping on this album that first track uh the title track really i think draws you right in you know it has this like building kind of like faint guitar lead up and then you hear uh, elizabeth stokes vocals just like coming in so crisp and clear and it has these like small guitar solos throughout that kind of flourish throughout and it just is this like really beautifully sung beautifully performed uh track and then by like the end the drums really come in hard about like three-fourths of the way through and you're just like okay this is the best album i'm like on board with um and i think honestly this album from track to track really flowed really well too which I think helped me stay really engaged. It didn't feel like there were many lulls, even the, the tracks where they maybe switched things up totally or tried to take it down all really worked for me. Um, what what other songs stood out to you? Uh, yeah, I liked Best Left specifically for the way Stokes' vocals kind of play with the rest of the band's vocals coming in behind her, like mm. a call and response type vibe. I thought that was very fun. Nice to hear that. Uh, your side. I thought the drums in particular, that work was very catchy. And then uh, was it Silence is Golden? One of the lead singles is mm. just really up tempo, more uh, heavier on the guitar than some of their other tracks. And I thought that one uh, hit particularly hard. Yeah, I, I think those are all standouts for me as well. Another one I really liked was Head in the Clouds. Um, I, I, that song is just like has so much momentum to it and it's just so driving and i really loved the chorus on it you know head in the clouds soul in the dirt like i think really highlights how they do a really nice job of storytelling but also could just have these like two liners that are kind of like get across what they're trying to um make you feel yeah you know it's hard because as i was like preparing to talk about this album i didn't feel like like there was anything like earth shattering from this it's just like mm. really competently made really solidly made um rock album which we don't get a lot of i guess nowadays especially from uh younger or or not as seasoned bands and i guess i was wondering like the beths as a rock band who are their peers <laughs> you know like who are who else is like doing this in the space in the same way it's it's all solo artists. In Correct. Yeah. Exactly so. right. Yeah, I'm not sure who their band peer is. That's a great question. <laughs> you know, I guess maybe like like Cloud Nothings. Are they still making music? I think so. Yeah, they're we a little older about than them. them. Even then. Yeah. Um, gosh, that's a great question. You know? Um, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I th- but I think that speaks to one just like, like you said before, the title of this track with... Uh, you know, speaking to the larger state of rock music, but also I think the best have kind of established themselves as like this singular sound in rock right now that really uh, is is looking for it. I guess like as I'm as I'm like talking this out, maybe <laughs> Rolling Blackouts, Coastal Fever uh, hmm. is like someone that's kind of in that sphere, but not not nearly to the level of the best in my opinion. So. It's uh 
it's a, it's a real dry wasteland out there for rock music. I'd really recommend this album to anyone that likes rock, though. Definitely check it out. Why don't we talk about a more established rock band not dropping their third album, but actually their tenth, Death Cab for Cutie with Asphalt Meadows. Ben Gibbard's back, dog. I, I, I know you missed him. Can't say I've thought about Ben Gibbard since his surprise appearance on the Chance the Rapper album in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that actually brings me to a great point, Dave. Or maybe a great question. Where's Chance? When are we get music expecting it this year. I don't know. It's a good question. Mm. He's been working. Yeah. He's been putting little things out here and there. So <laughs> we'll find out soon. Maybe Ben will be on that album, too maybe and uh I'm not really rooting for that honestly in, in, in the <laughs> interest of chance but <laughs> yeah i don't know who i want on that chance album at this point like who he usually collaborates with that would be interesting yeah anyways this is a death cat for cutie review not a chance the rapper uh re- relitigation so why don't we get back to asphalt meadows last time we talked about death cab specifically was 2018 with thank you for today which i think we both really liked um, I, I don't know if we like loved it, but I think we were like, yeah, Death Cab still makes some pretty good albums from time to time. And uh, it's been another four years. And I, I think my opinion remains exactly the same. Death Cab for Cutie is an incredibly, incredibly competent band who makes really good music, but it's just like they've made so much of the same music at this point. Uh, I don't know if there's anything on Asphalt Meadows that jumps out to me as like, Man, Death Cab's really going for it on this album. Did you have that feel? I mean, twenty five years into the band's career, it'd be a surprise if they that was the case, right? Like true album ten, as you said. Yeah, no, I mean, I didn't, you know, I I didn't take away anything too great from this. It, it, it's totally fine. I think the instrumentation it is pretty good. There are some fun moments where the guitar like really rips in out of nowhere. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, we're vibing here. I, I was a bit disappointed in some of the lyrics, particularly like I feel like some of the hooks, like some of the some of the refrains. I'm like, man, these are like some corny ass lines, my guy. Like <laughs> you guys are you guys are deep in the career here. Surely you could do a little better than really letting me know how cold the winter is in Saskatchewan. You know, <laughs> I mean, they, they're an uh, upper northwestern band who talks about upper northwestern shit. That's just like who they are at this point and uh, you know death cab i guess that's a good point when you think about like a lot of the lyrics on transcendentalism and stuff like that it was like really really like meaningful shit and like really like thought-provoking um you know you think about like brothers on a hotel bed or something like that and it's like that's that kind of stuff's moving i don't know if they like still throw their 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 fastball in that way i think they're working with some different stuff here um as, a, as I think about, like, what really stood out to me about Asphalt Meadows, I think it was just them, like, obviously trying on a few different hats here, right? Fox Love Through the Clear Cut is this more, like, spoken word track that's a little bit more, like, shoegazy at times, a little more washed out in ways. And then, like, the next track, Pepper, is this stripped-down acoustic track that has, like, some flares of, like drums here and there but it's really like stripped down like sitting on a bench type of track with an acoustic guitar and then you get to i miss strangers which is like a little more like joy division right a little bit more like 80s rock and so there's it's them definitely like trying on a few like sounds and seeing how it works while still kind of keeping to the same death cab feel and i think it all works pretty well i definitely enjoy the album but like you said 10 albums in how much how much more new stuff are we gonna get from them but this is the same conversation we had just a few weeks ago with um oh man who what was the rapper that it wasn't pearl jam it was i'm gonna look it up while we talk but i feel like we have this conversation <laughs> a lot with with rock bands <laughs> yeah yeah no for sure i think um just speaking to what i said before some of the lyrical moments kind of took me out of it you know i think starting off with i don't know how i survive that hook of I don't know how I survive. It's like, okay, bro, like, I get it. You're lucky the guitar is like really ripping right now because otherwise this song would be annoying to me. <laughs> but, you know, like later on with uh, Rand McNally, like, don't let the light fade. 
It's like I got it the first time. You know, it's like I don't know, like some of these some of these refrains just like really like started to dwell on me. And I think no uh no song worse than I miss strangers because I was like, you know, I miss strangers more than my own friends. It's like, you know what? Releasing a song in twenty twenty two, it doesn't hit the same as if you put this out in twenty twenty. My guy, you miss mm-hmm. strangers, go see some strangers. <laughs> that is a pandemic song that you just put out too late. Like I don't get it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I guess I didn't really like think too much about it. I, I wonder if what they're going for there was like talking about how like people that became strangers are people that they miss more than like actual like strangers, you know? I don't know. And that that would be my, my reading on it, knowing Death Cab, but I, I can see how that doesn't come across so clearly and can be a little annoying. Um were there any tracks you did like, Dave? Yeah, the first one, just for the rock. Um yeah. and even um Wheat Like Waves, despite the Saskatchewan line, I do think the uh, drums sound uh, really nice on that one. Yeah. I like Roman Candles. I think it's like got some nice like synths at the end of it. It really builds up. Almost kind of feels like a killer song at times. Um, you know, as I, was, as I was listening through, there's a couple of tracks that really sound familiar or really sound similar. Like, Here to Forever and I'm a Strangers have like a very similar feel to me just like different pr- production on it but um near the end like fragments from the decade i don't know what it was but something about that like more like just like washed out distorted vocal um tinge that they put on his vocals kind of reminds me of some old school death cab feel so i think i really enjoyed that but yeah i don't i don't think this is death cabs like top five albums ever it's probably like six or seventh but that's kind of where they're at and i'm okay with that i just wonder with ben gibbard like he's done so many different projects throughout his life i wonder if he would like want to do some different collaborations and just more production moving forward i don't know he's always working so (sighs) ready to move on to our girl rena was the album you were thinking of Arcade Fire's album this year? No, it was Muse. Muse. Oh, okay. just a few weeks back, we yep, basically had the same talk. We were like, "Yeah, Muse just made their same album from 2001." So, got it. Um, anyways, uh, Nostalgia Best of 2022 on Spotify. Check that out. Let's talk about Rina Sawayama, Dave, an artist that you uh you talked about a lot a couple of years back as like a breakout artist for you. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. I had Rina's debut album, Sawayama, on my top 10 albums of 2020, number four, to be exact, which was a really huge fan of Rina's, I think, really uncanny ability to bring multiple genres together, specifically genres of the past, you know, combining like traditional, like 2000s pop melodies with new metal. It's just not something you were getting from anyone else. And I was really quite struck with that. Rena EP from 2017. I think some of those songs are absolutely amazing to this day. But that album Sawayama has a ton of bangers on it too for these this uncanny quality. You know, songs like Excess and Best Friend and Como de Garçons. You know, there's just some really cool songs on here, and Mm -hmm. it makes sense that Rena has now come into the uh, purview of Charlie XCX. Of course, featured on Charlie's album Crash earlier this year. And, you know, I think the second Rena album, the first one with the true, like, hype and big fandom behind her at this point, and there was a lot of uh, anticipation for this second album, Hold the Girl. And I think it's, it's an interesting record because it's definitely different from Sawayama, and she's definitely doing some new, new stuff. And whether that's as engaging and as cool as some of her older stuff, uh, probably depends on the listener, but... You know, I think there's just a lot to like about Rena. That's still true. Dave, the answer to your, to what you just said is no, this is not as engaging as Sawayama. This album actually, I, I felt was um, f- uh, fairly a letdown for me, only because, like you, I think so eloquently put, Sawayama had so many songs that felt so inventive and singular and made Rena such an exciting new artist uh, because she was like putting out music that i i 
don't think I'd ever heard like appear to, um, you know, something like Comet des Garçons, um, Dynasty, like you mentioned, Excess, like those songs are straight bangers and like blend so many genres. So I like in such a beautiful way, Excess, those guitars at the beginning, there's nothing, nothing as engaging as those guitars on Hold This Girl as uh, and, and it's just like so disappointing to me because i was expecting to get a few moments where i was like yes mm. there there's rena mm. and it felt like she kind of went more for like a more personal and more just like straightforward pop album yeah 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 for the most part hold the girl is more conventional more traditional and i think it does come across as rena having sanded down her edges a little bit on this and there's still some some really cool moments that bring you back to the appeal of her past work, but a lot of the other stuff is a lot more a lot more conventional pop album, and that's inherently just not as engaging and not as interesting as her other stuff. Despite the fact that she is a strong vocalist, and it's not like those songs are necessarily bad, but it's just they're not nearly as cool as the other stuff. I I, I think I um was really impressed with her vocals and i think that is really what carries her you know it's not like the title track hold the girl her vocal performance of that is dynamite and just like blows you away um and, and you do get a few moments and a few songs that are pretty catchy but then there's also some moments that feel kind of cringy um uh, and, and didn't really totally work for me something like frankenstein i didn't really like love the lyrics on that it just felt kind of like i don't know too like straightforward and kind of like normy for what I expect from from Rena, but you know I I guess maybe I'm being too hard as I say because I I did definitely enjoy the album. I think I just expected so much, and mm. uh, today is a, a big uh, expectation day because as we talked about in some other albums, going into NCT with no expectations, I thought it was great. Going into Rena, I had high expectations, and I was like, ah, man, didn't live up to mm-hmm. the inventiveness. Tell me about the tracks that you really loved, though. Yeah, so I totally agree on Hold the Girl. I think the Rena vocal performance is awesome, and the way that song just like really builds up with these these violins and the beat just gets like progressively uh, harder and more electronic as the song goes. Really great. Uh, she really smashed that one. Of course, the lead single, This Hell, I really dig as kind of like a like throwback country pop song with contemporary lyrics thrown in you know a lot of people have talked about that as like a and a lot of to like Lil Nas X just because of like the the subject matter to it but I think that one's just really catchy really fun to listen to um but I think the, the song that's probably most engaging for its familiarity with her past work in a good way would be imagining because I think the arena performance is awesome but ultimately that is just a hyper pop song that is a Charlie vibe mm-hmm. right there and i think that song is fun that beat is gnarly like i love that one. Oh yes definitely that was definitely a standout for me as well um yeah you know even the first song like minor feelings i think was like an interesting like way to introduce that this album was going to be a little more stripped back but i like her vocal performance on that because it's uh there's so much feeling especially by the end of the song like you really get the sense that she's going for this more like personal type of album here so i thought that was like a good way to like preface the album um i'm trying to think of what other songs really stood out to me hurricanes is a song Mm. that kind of goes in like the same vein as excess but has more of like a build-up by the end when the guitars are really ripping i think that's like some of the moments I really like probably more rock than either of the two rock albums we talked about to this point, which is pretty <laughs> mm. funny to say. Um, yeah. I mean, w- did you say, would you say that you were like pleased with the album? Were you like, man, I got what I was looking for. From you know, I, I, I guess I could say like m- moderate disappointment. I'm really happy about getting another song like imagining, but you know, songs like catch me in the air songs like phantom. Those are just, those are just like dull straightforward songs and like it doesn't matter how good she sings like they're just they're just lackluster you know and mm-hmm. the the worst songs on Sawayama were were bad or, or or not as good because of having too much going on I think I just would rather defer to that than something that's kind of 
you know, simple like some of these other tracks on Hold the Girl, which this isn't whole not a whole lot to them. Um, yeah. You know, I think I wasn't really sure what to expect in that regard because while this hell definitely feels much more poppy, but still still throwback in a sense, right? I was like, okay, that's great. I'd love to hear more stuff like this. The other single that she put out that's not on this album is Chosen Family with Elton John, which is just like a you know, like an acoustic like vocal duet type song and it's like huh that's definitely a very straightforward track and obviously she made that because elton expressed fandom to her after sawayama came out awesome to see that connection but you know i started hearing you know like catch me in the air as a single i'm like oh, this I'm not feeling this one you know <laughs> it's like yeah and i think ultimately there's still a bit of variety on here because you have like songs like holy and uh your age which have these like really pulsing like bass beats and yeah then, like I mentioned, imagining a straight hyper pop. This hell's, you know, throwback country pop. And if you separate those songs from these kind of boring, straightforward vocal tracks we mentioned, like, there's still a lot to like. Um, but yeah, I think overall, as like a body of work, it's definitely not as um, fulfilling as Sawayama or the Rena EB. I think uh, it's a it's a fine addition. And, you know, if this was if this album came first before we got Sawayama, we probably would be talking about how this is such like a, you know, her kind of like busting on the scene. It's all about kind of like how you follow up to something as great as that. And it, it probably, in my opinion, or at least for my taste, didn't match what I was hoping for. But you mentioned like a lot of the songs, um, Your Age, Imagining, um, Hold the Girl, like there, there's a lot to love on this. And she's just she's an exciting artist. And I, I'm, I'm really excited to see what we get from her moving forward i actually think one of the like elements in this album that really stood out was just how much she was infusing like classic like edm and dance um flourishes mm -hmm. into the tracks in little ways and i i think that we probably will be getting more of that sound uh, at some point from her moving forward so uh definitely check out hold the girl let us know your thoughts below but dave it's time we, we've been talking about this for weeks black pink in your area they're here we're born pink, converted pink, whatever you want to say. How, how are you feeling about this Black Pink album? Just give me your, your temperature after your, like your first couple listens. Yeah, you know, I, I'm very pleased with it. I'm ultimately just a huge Black Pink fan. Look at my Instagram discover. It's just Jenny and G Jisoo and Lisa and Rose everywhere. I just get served <laughs> Black Pink shit because I keep watching and looking at it. You know, I just woke up in the mirror one day. I said, you know, I'm just like a genuine like blink. I'm just a huge fan of this group. And I really f enjoy just following them. And that's what makes getting now like Born Pink so exciting, but also so um, frustrating because once again, it's such a short, succinct listen. Please, YG, bless us with more <laughs> Blackpink wow. songs. Only eight tracks, 25 minutes. It's like over before it's even started, you know, but what we did get, I did enjoy and just happy to have the group back. Excited to... uh see them super active again as a unit and of course the born pink world tour i'm thinking about going to that some way we'll see but uh yeah i uh Drop i did bag. enjoy born pink um dave you do realize that you basically just described like one of the like biggest rules in show business always leave them wanting more and black pink they're nailing it <laughs> they get in and out they always leave you wanting more they're fucking crushing it and you know i have to say my first listen to this album, I was like, oh, you know, I, I don't know if if I got exactly what I was expecting from this. Put it on in my car. It rips like the, this album rips. There's a few few songs that like I probably am not going to go back to nearly as much as some of the others. But I'd say out of the eight tracks, there's probably like at least five, maybe six absolute bangers. Uh, very, very pleased with this. Uh, we've already talked about black or uh, sorry we've already talked about pink venom the mm -hmm. single from this uh that song still just an absolute rocket of a song like yeah man fucking great single uh but really the first three tracks of this album pink venom shut down and type of girl Ooh. Ooh. like i do do three tracks get better than that i don't know heaters <laughs> absolute heaters and and all in different ways which is like Mm -hmm. the really impressive part to it i gotta say for being a, a girl group i don't uh, or just being like 
a, a non like hip hop group in general, they might have some of like the best like ad libs and like just like throw away like backup lines. The black pink mm-hmm. chant at the beginning of Pink Venom and then black pink in your area. Like Yes, of course. Incredible. Just incredible. Yeah. Oh yeah. Black pink in your area always hits whenever you hear it. And it's great. You know, we we did a song review on Pink Venom. Check that out. YouTube.com says Nostalgia Pod. One thing, just like final addendum on that. Like you said, very catchy song in line with all their other big lead singles. Just another one in their canon. It, it, it's tremendous. Video is awesome. But one thing that's like re- I, I've really come to appreciate about it is right in the beginning, beginning when Jenny says kick in the door, wave in the cocoa. Interpolating Biggie Smalls kick in the door, of course. But I actually think that's like a really smart interpolation because Jenny's an ambassador for Chanel. Waving the cocoa oh. is like a super witty line. I love that shit. Wow. And of course, also Lisa interpolating Rihanna. People know this at this point. Pink yeah. Venom uh, was their biggest charting hit to date. 22 on Hot 100 in the US. Right, and so. two weeks, number one on the uh, Billboard Global chart. Very great to see that. Um, they performed at the VMAs. But I think the second song, Shut Down, it's like, oh my god, they did it again. They just gave us another heater. Like, And I think the reason I like Blackpink so much, and they're my favorite K-pop group, is they they just have like really genuine bite to their music. Like, mm-hmm. I love the aggression. And yeah, so on Shut Down... Yeah, of course. And on Shut Down, you get... Jenny and Lisa rapping again, first verse in Korean, second version in English. But also on that song, you have like serious attitude from Jisoo and Rose too. And it's like, Rose, flex on me. I love hearing Rose flex. Like, I think that song is so fun. And <laughs> n- another great video. Yeah, the video is incredible. Their style is so fucking cool. Like, um, Lisa in the picture behind you uh, if you're watching on YouTube but in the video mm-hmm. it looks a little bit like Billie Eilish in a way you know oh, like with sure. her hair and everything but like they're just like <laughs> they just ooze like, swag they, they they just ooze oh, yeah. absolute like just stardom and they carry themselves and you can really hear on this album just how confident they are they carry themselves as absolute stars because they are you know mm-hmm. you, you, you can't do what they did at Coachella a few years back if you aren't fucking confident and just absolute stars you can't put out an album like this if you aren't absolute stars and i agree i think shut down is an absolute banger and then type of girl mm. the next track comes in you get the snaps it's a little bit more like bubblegum poppy but then that horn comes in and they just fucking like stomp you out on this but in like the sweetest way possible it's really really impressive mm. man I, I was just like blown away with these three i just ran them back immediately oh hell yeah and then like once again it's like right in line with the vibe you want jenny put money on the table not your dinner it's like mm-hmm. my something in my bank account can figure like it, it, it's like yes like it, it all fits and i think with uh with type of girl i really like the way like the b kind of slows down and then builds up as yeah. you said um the hook from b says really good um yeah, I I, th- I think Type of Girl, like, it's probably being a little under-remarked upon right now because of how, like, you know, big shutdown is and how everyone's liking that right now. But, yeah, I think Type of Girl is another great entry. It's, like, in a sense, it's, like, it's like the third banger, right? It's, like, not as big yeah. as Pink Venom or Shutdown, but it's still good in its own regard. Um, yeah, I, I think um, the production is a lot of fun on this, right? Like, the way Shutdown starts with this, like, violin sample, like an Italian, like like strings right there like that that was really fun um and like once again you have like this amazing outro from blackpink like on so many of their other bangers the way shutdown ends um but then they really switch it up after the bangers right yeah 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 which has jisoo and rose co-writing on there that's got like heavy guitar and, and drums you know and it's ultimately like a vibe song that's definitely more of a jisoo and rose showcase after the rappers dominate the early songs but I, I think that one that one's kind of interesting because it's like a much more understated song where it's really more about those sung verses and the hook is very short and it's almost like letting the beat play for the remainder of the chorus, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the way that like the synths are right before like some of the choruses, like the, I think it's about like the 
I don't know, like maybe like 120 mark or something. Kind of reminded me of Metro Station Shake It. Like, I, I don't know why. Something about it was just like very similar to me. But I, I definitely think it's a nice switch up after the first three. And then you get Hard to Love, which so I didn't love Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. It's probably one of the tracks I mm-hmm. liked least on it on this. It, it is really, sparse get, at the end of the day. Yeah. And then you get Hard to Love, which is the next one. And they start off again kind of sparse. So I was like, oh, where are we going here? But then Hard to Love just fucking kicks into this groovy like th- that reminded me of like Charlie Poop, like something he would mm. make, like kind of be. And it's just like super fun, like makes you want to like just dance yeah. around. And I was like, Rose oh. solo song, too. A big surprise. Just Rose yes. on that one. And she crushes it, dude. I-, I think she's so great vocally on it and just like gives mm. such a nice performance. And then it also is kind of nice to have a switch up where it's just one artist on this. And I think that's great yeah. that they as a group are like allowing each other to do that. Like not everybody has to be on every song or not everybody has to like you know, like share a track. Yeah, I think I would I would agree with that more if it, we just didn't get such sparse track lists from them. Like this mm. is an eight song album, Pink Venom and Ready for Love were previously released. So then of the other six songs, one of those is a solo track. It's like, man, like it's just it's just so slight. Right. Clearly by design on YG's part. But yeah, I thought I thought Rose was good on that. You know, again you hear the guitar, which was like her solo tracks that we heard last year. Very familiar. Um, I think the song I disliked the most, or, you know, liked the least, was uh, the next song, uh, The Happiest Girl, just because yeah. it's just kind of a quiet piano ballad. It's also all in English. Like, it's it's okay. You know, I think the next song after that, Tally, still pretty ballad ballady, but I think it's a much more, like, engaging track. Yeah, you get that guitar in Tally, and just even that first, like, I say fuck it when I feel it. Like you're just drawn right back in. I agree. The happiest girl was probably my least favorite as well. And then Ready for Love, I thought was like a, like a more EDM, more like classic K-pop feeling song. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay, like I, I appreciate that they like are pulling in a, some more like I think like OG influence there. And I, I think it's a really fun track too. So like a good way to like kind of end the album so i I think it kind of tails off halfway through but still really strong yeah that that was i wasn't expecting to see ready for love on this ready for love came out like two months ago like a month or so before pink venom as a like virtual like promo single alongside the video game PUBG mobile as like a virtual concert and like they put out like a you know like a ai like music video with black of blackpink with this song i was like okay that's just like a, a, not a throwaway, but like it's a Lucy. Mm-hmm. And then, no, actually, it's on the album, and the album is still <laughs> only eight songs. It's like, motherfuckers, give us more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I gotta say, like, they, they're just, they're, they're bound to just be in our lives for the next however many years they want to be doing this. And I'm sure we're going to be getting a lot of solo stuff from them. They're, they're just rockets complete in every single way possible. Any other, any last thoughts on, Born Pink. I've been really fucking with Shutdown this weekend. I just <laughs> really love the banger. And I really love that they put out the uh, dance performance music videos in addition to the normal music videos. Because then you actually see like the live performance choreography that they will do like in, you know, in real life as opposed to the music video set. And I think those are a lot of fun. You saw them perform that on Kimmel this past weekend too. Um, yeah, man. I'm uh, definitely excited to see more footage of like what happens with the born pink world tour because i really enjoyed in the lead up to this album revisiting the uh it's like the 2019 2020 tour they did and they recorded it at the tokyo dome show they did where they played for like you know like fifty thousand people or something and like that's like really fun to just like hear like that energy like a few years back when they had way less music out and it's like hear like and see them perform that and i just want to see like what does their new set look like and how do they spice stuff up? So there's, and hopefully they just, they just be more active. You know, it'd be really fun if they start to feature on more people's work as soloists. Like you had, I think there was that one Lisa feature this past year for that DJ snake song. But like, other than that, they really haven't worked with anyone but themselves. And except for a few like other K-pop exceptions. So like, it would be cool to hear um, them kind of like get 
let loose in the solo sense and like because like jenny and lisa in particular are so so famous you know they're both like the 50 top 50 most followed instagram accounts you know like they are gigantic people and you know when you have people like taylor swift expressing their fandom for them like you should like let them shine a little bit and work with some other people you know like you look at the track list you look at the producer credits and it's like blackpink album it's still very much a yg in-house affair you know led by teddy park so the the possibility of blackpink getting to work you know across the pond a little bit more would be pretty cool too but even if they don't i'm still really loving what they're up to right now you know i was surprised when you sent me this tweet this weekend but according to hits daily double un verano sinti is gonna outsell blackpink's born pink this weekend can you believe that yeah, I think ultimately it says more about Bad Bunny than it does about Black Bad, Black yeah. Pink. The Bad Bunny album is just the biggest album of the year and has been doing this, you know, being the best of best selling album or second best selling album of the week for like four months running now. So it's really nothing against Black Pink at all. But um, yeah, definitely didn't expect to see that, given how strong the the fan base is for Black Pink. So we'll see if that holds. I think this might energize the Blinks to uh, stream and buy more music. We'll see. Bad Bunny, man, the, that guy's just taking over the world. It's insane. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, we knew that before this album, but this album has just leveled him up so much. Um, Blackpink, fucking awesome album. Thank you for it. Really appreciate it. And not, check again, check out our Nostalgia Best of 2022 playlist where we'll be adding a Blackpink song or two. Um, let's move on to TV, though, where we're talking Atlanta. Dave? Atlanta season four, the final season after an up and down season three. I don't want to say disappointing. I, mm-hmm. I think up and down is the right way to put it. Right. Polarizing. Yeah. You know, a, a, lot, a lot less of the OG uh, four, a lot more storytelling about racial politics and racial dynamics in America through these different stories and um, always inventive, always interesting if if not controversial at times and i was really really happy to watch these first two episodes of season four because it just felt like we got back to the show that we all loved in season one where you're putting the four back together or pairing them off together and letting them just do weird shit in atlanta in this like Mm -hmm. kind of like twilight zoney atlanta world and man i just really enjoyed these first two episodes a lot whether it was you know, seeing Darius being chased by a, a woman in Target for hours on hours with a knife. Uh, you know, Paperboy going on a scavenger hunt through a rap song. Seeing Van and Earn teamed up again together. All the mm-hmm. therapy stuff. It was all really, really great, yep. in my opinion. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, it it is also just a weird feeling to be having the fourth and final Atlanta season only f- what four months after atlanta season three ended which in and of itself was after a four-year wait you know four years the four months and now we're done it's uh almost over but yeah i think i think that's exactly right just being back in atlanta being back in this the show's namesake setting and these two first two episodes were very reminiscent of some of the best qualities and best episodes of the series to this point And yeah, I think one of the most polarizing aspects about season three, as you said, is that there were several episodes where we don't see the main cast at all. And I thought that was happening once again in the second episode of season four when we meet this new character. But then, of course, it gets brought back around to the end, I think, a really funny and satisfying manner. But at the start, I was like, oh, my God, no, they're doing it again. Yep. Yeah. We're going to jump to episode two. But in episode two, when they, they tell the story of this woman who thinks that she's getting her big break as a children's author and seeing her whole journey alongside this juxta- or juxtaposed against Earn's their therapy journey, you know, which I think is actually yeah. really interesting and really well done. And um, I think for how many shows we've watched recently where there's been like just straight up therapy scenes, I thought that one, this one was done pretty well. You know, obviously I think some like liberties taken in terms of how therapy actually like goes sometimes, but like <laughs> definitely really interesting. And then, and then the payoff at the end, you know, where you you have Earn who set up this elaborate way of like 
ruining this woman's life basically just to kind of come around to the idea of like oh i definitely still need to be in therapy like i have issues like really yeah. really well done and don glover yep. delivers it so well at the end uh he, he's he's really a talent like i i, I kind of forgot how much i miss just seeing him play this character in season three yeah his um reaction expressions are are always awesome um <laughs> Yeah, I really like that therapy scene. Just it, it was nice to be with that, but also like kind of peeling back those urn layers and actually calling back to why urn left Princeton, something that is referenced early on, but we don't know why. That's done in a really effective way, and I, I think season four through this part, like you know, we have to. These characters have progressed. They have uh, developed through three seasons, where urn is no longer grinding as a broke boy, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Al is super successful and for all intents and purposes, rich, you know, it's like, it, it, they're different now, but like that core Atlanta DNA is still here. And it's really, I think, fun to now see that again in that Atlanta setting after, you know, Ern and Al in particular have both made it. Um, so you hear how rich I'm making you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're just throwing your money away. He's going to therapy. <laughs> that was so good. And I, but I agree. I think that like progression and seeing them like move past the struggling is really nice. Um, and in hearing, I think some of the potential conflicts that's being set up, you know, is earn as this person who has come into his own as a music manager, potentially going to have to leave Atlanta um, what's that going right. to mean for his family? I think that's pretty interesting. You know, how will that impact his relationship with, uh, with Paperboy, with Darius, with with Van? Obviously, it was nice to hear them really talk about um, their daughter. Uh, is Tati is that the daughter's name? Yeah. Lottie with an L. Lottie, thank you. Yes, um, who was kind of an afterthought until, except for like some of the Van stuff in season three, um, and you know has kind of come in and out of the show when it's like convenient for the story that they're trying to tell, but I think it's going to mm -hmm. be more of a central figure. Um, and I think just speaks more to the maturation of the show as these people have matured in their life. You know, uh, I think Don Glover's like 40 or in his forties now. And um, I think all these characters and all these actors are just at a different point of their life of where they were when the show started. So it's, it's kind of nice to see like the storylines mature a little bit as well. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I'm most hopeful to see like really strong Van season from yeah. Zazie Beats because I think Van is the character that gets short shrift the most of our core group, and that's also why like there was such polarizing reception in the parts of season three. It's like it's not that those one-off episodes were bad; they weren't. I thought like the reparations one with Justin Barth in particular is very engaging and thought-provoking, mm -hmm. but just like we love these characters and the performances are great. We just want more time with these people because we know the yeah. show's ending soon, you know. And Van in particular is someone that really gets kind of damaged by that lack of time, where the only thing of true consequence to her in season three was, you know, the, the kind of elaborate, uh, was it the French episode, which is really good, but also very surreal, right? It doesn't actually really mm -hmm. present any, like, character progression, right? So I just really hope that, like, Van isn't, like, off to the side and gets to kind of be independent, because also, like, majority of her character work is still like her relationship or mm -hmm. you know co-parenting situation with Ern, right it's always how she relates with Ern. whereas someone like darius even though obviously he's very connected to al he's still afforded all these like individual scenes and moments across the series to be this very unique character with keith stanfield a really uh awesome performance as we all know but like Darius gets to be someone like like an avatar for the audience to like express like these like really some of the best like societal comment that the show has right and like that's how they use Darius even like Darius in the true Atlanta plot is just like Al's boy you know it'd be really cool if they could still they could find they found a way for Van to also kind of serve like the greater Atlanta good the the, the Atlanta mission you know so remains to be seen because she is she unfortunately is a bit up and down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just like the whole stuff with episode one where Al goes on this like amazing scavenger hunt for this deceased rapper Blue Blood 
Like yeah. I thought that whole montage was awesome where he like scans the QR code tattoo on the guy's forearm. Mm-hmm. So funny. So and then, good. And then everything with Van and um Earn just like going to this like popular like Atlanta outdoor mall and like I was like, oh wait, no, this is like a classic Atlanta thing. It's kinda like a horror movie, right? That all these exes mm-hmm. of the past are around and they can't escape. And where's the car part? That was so good. And Honestly, yeah. the funniest, the biggest laugh out loud moment I've had in a while is where it, uh, Van or, uh, Van meets the ex at the AT and T store, and he's like, "Oh, Van, I, I haven't seen you since the Kid Ink concert." <laughs> yeah. I died right there, and I paused, <laughs> and I started up again, and then they have Ern go, "Kid Ink concert." It's like such a <laughs> such a stray for Kid Ink out of nowhere. <laughs> so funny. Yeah, I, I, that that was a really like funny throwaway, but just like. Uh, when I heard it, I was like, Kid Ink, man, I haven't heard that name in forever. And then they actually yeah, acknowledged gone. that. So good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I really loved just seeing them back together. You know, um, Ern and Van really like playing off each other. Because a lot, even in um, season three, a lot of the time when you saw it, Van was going through such a like surreal, but also like a very obvious, like emotional, emotionally turmoil type situation that like she was almost like, like non functional, just kind of like, catatonic in ways and so yeah. it, it, i think the last time you see them interact Ern actually says like are you good and then that's the episode where she goes on the adventure where she sees like tupac get killed um you know his like end of life ceremony so mm-hmm. it's it's very like nice just to see them back together hilarious having them like walking down the street like talking about the last time they like saw each of their exes like <laughs> the, that's the last white male that i kissed back in 2013 like it's just like really like funny like line deliveries as well and then obviously you got the darius stuff in that episode with this crazy woman in this wheelchair who's trying to stop a looter even though he's not looting he was just trying to you know return his gift to air fryer in, in a, a classic looting. darius <laughs> incredible and just like really funny like to like think of that mm-hmm. um and then, like you know, he just hops up and runs away, and this person just like ever coming. And you, know, it, it's funny, but then also thinking about the metaphor of like, you know, the the racial politics of it all is really like mm-hmm. they they always seem to find a way to kind of tie that in really well. So, yeah, love these first two episodes. Super excited for this season. Um, you know, just kind of looking around, it looks like we're going to get uh, Cat Williams back, who was one of my mm-hmm. favorite um, like guest yeah. appearances on the show with the uh, Florida Kendrick Man Boy. episode. Yeah yeah so um man really excited to see what he, they we just got sure tracy back surprises. in episode two you know? i know speaking of callbacks that was great too <laughs> incredible incredible so um i'm excited to see what what comes out of this for sure um any last thoughts Are you ready to move on to industry it is kind of crazy that like before we know it the show is done right like this show premiered in 2016 Season two comes out and there's a huge wait and now it's this year and then it's over, you know, it's like, what's next for, and I think that that's probably factored in too. I see the way season three was the way it is. where like Zazie, Lakeith, DG and Brian Tyree Henry are all super famous and successful now. So like, it's kind of hard for them to all be on a show, you know? So obviously looking forward to seeing what's next for all of them. Once this is done, obviously Brian Tyree Henry has been working a lot in Hollywood and, I think the the next Donald Glover project, next Donald Stephen Glover project, would be very uh, hotly anticipated. Obviously, so we'll we'll be there before we know it. Yeah, it's crazy that it's all it's coming to an end, but we're gonna they're gonna be in our lives for a long time. So let's move on to industry, a show that has come into our lives and really I think asserted itself as just one of the like best like tv dramas that probably doesn't get recognized enough and you know season one really was like unexpected just like this hbo drama that you know about finance bros and the finance culture in london mm-hmm. and it was really like i feel like a word of mouth show you know one that oh, like yeah. a few people watched and were like man this is really enjoying the show more people started watching by the end of the year was like oh industry really really solid first season really love a lot of the characters uh some really great performances man season two we we talked about the premiere a few weeks back season two absolutely established it as one of the best tv dramas hands down and i think just one of the like 
most engaging shows episode to episode the way that the show is able to like build tension in so many different ways and like play these dynamics and some of it i was like i should be played out of this jesse bloom harper relationship by now but somehow every single episode it like kind of sucked me back in I, I was just like blown away by the second season how about you oh yeah I, it was absolutely tremendous huge level up and you have to imagine the word of mouth is really picking up at this point you know uh, i really did love season one partially due to its unexpectedness right you have these two former finance people and mickey down and conrad k bringing this drama to hbo and the bbc and it's like super credible as a finance show it's like it's like true like high finance like in the weeds it's written very intelligently people that aren't familiar with finance don't pick up on everything i certainly don't know everything they're talking about sometimes but it's also so expertly made where The characters are very well written and you get really invested in multiple story arcs and just the way the show builds and holds tension and also defies audience expectation. That was already strong in season one. And then they just fucking broke the knob off with season two and huge finale, huge penultimate episodes like this dropping bomb after bomb. And this show somehow has not been renewed for season three officially yet. You have to imagine they will tell us something very soon because it will be it just just a banger banger season yeah and you talked about the way that they get you invested in so many storylines and i think what they do really well is everybody on this show should be hateable everybody is despicable pretty much on this show and it's they do a really smart thing about like halfway through the season where they introduce this young up and coming like intern or like new hire new first who, year yeah, yeah who comes into this environment and is like what the hell is going on like she is just like totally like no like that is sexual assault like <laughs> and like it totally i think exposes the insanity of this culture or at least like the culture that is at pier point at this at this time and that these characters are living in and it really like just highlights that a lot of these people are not good people, or at least not acting in good ways. But it, it does a really good job in the second season of building out why these people do act this way. You know, you get the Harper episode with her brother in Berlin. You get um, Yasmin and, and everything with her dad. And then mm-hmm. talking to his dad's uh, or her former babysitter or her dad's like lover and, uh, you know, baby yeah. mama. And then you get the stuff with, um oh man robert I'm forgetting. robert yes thank you with with his dad and and you know his mom and, and all that mm-hmm. stuff it, that really builds out his traumatic past and it all really like informs like the character's actions even if you still are like man harper's really fucked up in this season she has a lot of fucked up shit <laughs> it really does yeah as me the way that she interacts with that new hire and and like really like belittles her or belittles her um, her old boss like uh, kenny mm-hmm. is like kenny, yep. really really like you you hate her at times but other times you like are so entranced by her and entranced by her performance and i i think she's probably the maybe, like, clear standout to me of season two i think every time that she's on screen i'm just like totally sucked in um but i i just think they do such a good job of building these characters out in, in such a full way it's really impressive Oh, totally. And with the way the finale uh, leaves you with this, like, you know, this, like, class of, uh, you know, bankers we have here, right? It's uh, Yaz is cut off from her family for the first time and, like, truly understanding just how privileged she was for the first time. And that's, like, something, like, you're introduced to right away. It's like, this is an extremely privileged, uh, elitist, wealthy person. And, you know, that gets exposed to her. And then, obviously, what happens to Harper, right? Not expected, leaving mm-hmm. Pure Point. And Rob, um, getting, you know, at, at one hand, it's like, oh, wait, is Rob going to get a DWI or something? Going to jail? Lose his job that way? No, no, no. That's not what's happening. Rob is actually just so fucked up that he's, like, accepted this parasitic, toxic relationship with one of his uh, clients, you know? And it's like, the way, like, those three are left there, even Gus, who's like kind of on the side but has a 
pretty strong like second half of season two. Even Gus, he got fired too. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like everyone's down bad <laughs> for this yeah. our, our our young group. <laughs> yeah, and I mean one of the one of the characters I that grew on me this season was was Rishi, right? Like mm. at, yeah. in season one, he's kind of like around, but it he's recurring in season one. Now he's like main cast on season yeah, two. Yeah, uh, Cigar Radia, um, I think skyrockets in, in season two. I think he's phenomenal, and every yeah. time like him as like the what is he called? He's, he's like, like the main the trader, banker, on, on the, the desk. market. Yeah, the market right. like CPS desk guy. Um, he is just like electric in that role and like the way he just is like yo fuck off like that like i'm gonna like it's so great and the back and forth between him and harper with like the bloom deals and stuff is so like intense and like you said they do a really good job of like they get in the weeds and i'm sure people who are in high finance are like listening and like catching so many more things but even if you don't really know like the nitty-gritty you can just tell the emotional turn, uh, turmoil and the fallout after each one. It makes it so riveting that you're just like sucked in. You want to like go back to these trading moments so much. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I really what, loved all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it like the end of either episode one or two where Harper is like on the phone, on the desk, and everyone's literally watching her. And then she nails it. I believe it's the, a deal with Bloom. And like everyone's like like clapping for her basically because yeah. she just like smashed it and like made the company like a shit ton of commission and stuff like that it's like mm-hmm. like the way like they build that tension though with the timing and they'll disperse like a trading screen you know uh, uh, and like it's like man like like you said you don't really have to know exactly what's going on to really feel that momentum and that really speaks to how strong and well crafted this series is that it's that legible to people that don't actually really know the the a to b of what's happening yeah um i also think one of the things they do really smartly in this season is the um they introduced david who is this mm-hmm. like dmv pure po- yeah he, the the like this pure point guy who's like looking out for the company but like the more you kind of get to know him he's just kind of like trying to like keep his head down and like just do what what's right kind of thing and he's thrust into this really fucked up environment where him doing like the right thing is like seen as like really really like <laughs> oh you're you're fucking us over you're doing something shitty and then he gets sucked into like the them jumping ship from pier point yeah because they're going to be like kind of you know trimming down people as they like move more of the company to new york and yeah. um seeing him as like this like pawn in this game and like kind of being used by all the people was just like heartbreaking in ways, but also like uh, he, uh, my feelings on him probably changed the most throughout the season. I go from really liking him, thinking yeah. he's like Eric's kind of like abusing him to thinking he's just like a total chud to like right. feeling like that like, for him. It's he's, like he's stealing everyone's job and closing down the desk. Fuck this guy. Right. Yeah. Then he gets involved with Harper briefly, starts helping her out, at least being good, you know good to her. And it's like, huh, you're right. And actually his name is Danny. Not David. Danny, you're right. Yeah, you're DVD right. too. I called him DMV. DVD. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think that was a really uh important figure to have on the show. Kind of vacates the role that Kenny had in season one, where Kenny was much more present in season one as like the direct, you know, uh, his direct report was Yaz at the time, and like we still have like the threads of that, of course, in season two. But having some new blood in the form of DVD and. Like you said, I think the way he really moves up and down as the plot progresses and how he interacts with the characters, like it is really thrilling at the end of the penultimate episode where Rishi, Harper, and Eric bring in DVD. Mm-hmm. And he not that he in because he is Has like the their connection. only like play at the time, right? And like yeah. gosh, and then from there, like Eric saying in the finale that he has no more moves left. And then you see the way the finale ends. And Eric actually did have uh, yeah. a move, and Harper doesn't even see it coming. She thinks it's more about the the trade that Bloom she does for Bloom at the end, which is uh, ethically questionable. But no, it's even beyond that, right? Huge call back to the pilot. Yeah, and it, you have to think that at least from everything we've seen, I, I do think the like potential insider trading um, that Harper was involved in with Bloom probably what is what led Eric to 
to make this move, right? right. It's actually kind of like a protection thing. To I'm like, doing this for you, as he put yeah. it. Yeah, but even though, even though she doesn't really understand that, and her her biggest fear is just not having anywhere else to go. You know, at this right. point, she doesn't have a connection to Bloom. Uh, doesn't want to go back to New York and face her family. Right. Um, right. As an yeah. American in London, she wants to stay in England. So I'm really interested to see what happens with her. Um, what was your feelings on Yaz throughout this season? I mean, she has the whole thing where she's connected with, um, I mean, I forgot her name, but the really like interesting Celeste. looking, beautiful, yeah, Celeste, uh, like uh, manager of these. Yeah. Like, it's like per, it's like wealth management as opposed to like portfolio right. work with the other guy. I don't, I don't exactly understand the difference between the two roles, but it's you know it's it's more upstairs at pier point mm-hmm. as they say yeah you know i thought that was interesting because like by taking yaz off like the more like i guess straightforward trading floor stuff you're kind of like exposing that character to like some different stuff and i think they really do a good job of kind of playing off uh, marissa bella's beauty and like the the, the be- character uh, yaz's beauty and like putting that into like the story in this new role and like they kind of defy your expectations pretty routinely, like where you think that's gonna go. They nod at all kinds of stuff, and um, the way the way it fizzles out, I think, was probably the strongest way it could, right? Where mm-hmm. they pay off all this family development that the series uh, this this season was interested in with Robert Yaz and Harper, and actually puts Yaz in a very interesting place now, right? Cut off from her her wealth and her uh, ease of life, right? And like, well, what what does that mean now? You know, Harper, unemployed, what does that mean now? Obviously, we're in a very intriguing place. But uh, yeah, I, I thought Yaz, um, it, you never really knew where it was going with her, but because Marissa Bell is just like that good and like the characters like that engaging, it was always um, one of like the highlights, I think, of, of the season just to be, in this and also have that like i said that different rhythm to the trading floor like hardcore stuff that's going on with harper and air yeah i thought it was really i thought it was a great move to kind of like separate her especially because like how sustainable would it be to have her and harper just having this like constant like dynamic on the floor where like harper's anxiety is at level thousand and just treating yaz like shit and yaz just like treating her terribly as well like the few interactions you get between them are really brutal (laughs) and like at the end seeing them like kind of coming back together and like acknowledge that and be like i said that like and well it was after i said that like nobody loves you like and i I thought that was like a pretty funny way to kind of like bring them back together and have them reconcile um but I, i i liked the way that it kind of forced yaz to confront her dad's uh i don't know relationship but also in propriety of some kind yeah but i think also just in general like the kind of people that they're working for right like bloom is like this like uh, i don't know he he's like a piece of shit but also just like he he, like thinks the whole thing's ridiculous and kind of sees like everything as like a game and everything's gamified and harper realizes that but also like doesn't realize how much she's being gamified within all of it yeah but yeah it's really like is seeing the underbelly of these people and it's kind of exposed through her dad, but just like it, the way that she's made to confront that makes everything I think really intriguing while also having this like supercharged sexual relationship with her boss. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Just like really, really fascinating dynamics to it all. And I, I just, yeah. I, I think Marissa Abella is someone that's going to be getting a lot more roles after this season. Yep, she was in the mix for one of those new biopics, if I remember right. I forget what wow. forget who it was, but yeah, she's definitely one to watch for sure. Yeah, I really like the way they had they they brought Yaz like into the um the sexual assault on the part of yeah. the the client, right? Like obviously, like that's like the big aspect of Rob's season. You're like, oh, where is that going? You know, is this kind of like a side thing because Rob's on the cast? Don't really know. And the way they bring it in when the client does it again to the new Nicole. the new hire and she's not fucking with it. And the way she brings that to Yaz and Yaz does not handle that professionally or even kindly the first time, right? Not good. And then on top of that, the way they, they, they put that on DVD and Kenny 
and they have Kenny be the one to confront Yaz for Mm -hmm. fucking this up badly, right? And then having Yaz, perhaps internally, and you see it later in the finale, realize that she really fucked that up and, 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 like mm-hmm. that was very uh, unethical and, and, and mean to 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 downplay it that way, right? Obviously, but she also gets to completely explode on Kenny mm-hmm. for the way he she was treated by him as her boss at the time in season one, right? It's like I thought that was like a really satisfying way to bring all that together, you know? Totally. Um, but then now they're keeping that thread going with Robert too, who's clearly just um, aimless uh, with his personal morals, unfortunately. Yeah, and I I think just like completely stuck in this like traumatic loop of wanting to like reconcile things with his mom, but not being able to, and so like sufficing to this like abusive relationship. Um, I agree with everything with like Yaz in that moment where she gets to ex- explode on Kenny, especially because like the stuff between her and Kenny is like there's so many undercurrents of like Yaz really just having so much anger towards him that she, that she won't express and just kind of keeps right. downplaying. And Kenny actually is like really trying to get it out of her. Cause he recognizes that she has every right to feel angry and he's pretty ridiculous. Like a lot of the season, like they really play up his like AA mentality and like, um, really apologetic. They, like, yeah, exactly. And they kind of make him look foolish in a sense, but that like moment of like, yeah, is actually screaming at him. I think not only exposes like how the show is kind of twisted your mindset, where it's like, oh, Kenny actually is acting like you know somebody who is trying to like reconcile and is trying to do well, even if he still is kind of like a weird piece of shit kind of guy. But Yaz is the one who you root for most of the time, and then it totally flips them over. And you're like, wow, Yaz, like what the fuck? Like that's super shitty of mm-hmm. you. I thought that was really smart. Um, you know, as as we're, as we're kind of working our way through here. I mentioned Rishi. We kind of moved off him. He the the finale is really fascinating for him. You know, someone that mm-hmm. is a crucial part of like all the moves being made. Are they going to go somewhere else? He's like clearly, I think, the standout piece along with Harper's relationship to Bloom, which she doesn't actually have when she's in a lot of these meetings. Yeah, but then all the stuff between him and Harper at the end is like unexpected and my, uh, just kind of like feels like there's like this whole new mess that's going to be coming up in future seasons uh a a lot to make sense of what are your thoughts yeah i definitely didn't expect that um rishi on the eve of his wedding um (laughs) consummating something with harper (laughs) unexpectedly just getting the poison out bro just gotta get the poison out and harper (laughs) responds yeah me too (laughs) it's a kind of like a, a thrillingly unexpected scene i was like oh my gosh yes like the, these people are so fucked up in the head they're so damn rich and they truly have no real problems and yet they just can't get their shit together and i love it and yeah, yeah i think the rishi the rishi all season is great just because like you said the performance is so good he has amazing one-liners even when like, he like, walks out of frame they like definitely like ADR and like one liners from him. And you, you hear it like you just hear like his lines, like just, you know, belittling something, right? Like just one liner stuff. But then to like really take it to a head here. And it's almost foreshadowed in a sense, right? Where like when they think they're moving to New York, Rishi is like uh, lamenting the fact that he could have like slayed in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. But uh, alas, he is uh, about to be married. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, it doesn't matter. Let's get this poison out in the bathroom <laughs> stall. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's just uh, uh, fascinating and uh, quick, I will say. Uh, not, not an impressive performance from Rishi, for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, just kind of thinking about anatomy there, I'm surprised it, it was that fast, given that, you know, I can't imagine it was super good or anything, you know. <laughs> I don't How to get like... the poison out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any, any other th- thoughts on industry, man? I mean, it's just a really fun show. Yeah, well, I think now we're in a like a really thrilling place where the Eric harper relationship has truly been fractured mm-hmm. and they literally don't even work at the same place anymore eric though has not been sent off the pasture which is alluded to and suggested all of season two eric is back in the game at least for now and harper is not so there's just a lot of possibility you know whether J. Duplass as bloom is back on the show don't know if he's not he was a great presence great performance um i'm sure they'll figure it out from here um, yeah, and just th- that unknown of Harper and Eric at this point, I think, is really gonna be really great. But I just really, I just have like total faith in Down and K to 
crush this this show moving forward. It's it's that good. Watch industry. It's fantastic. Uh, we didn't even really talk about Gus, but uh, really liked his arc in the second half of the season. I think his politicking will play a part. In He's a fucking three. Tory too. God damn. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's let's wrap up with the Woman King, Viola Davis's newest film, where she just gets to be a fucking badass the whole time. And uh, man, th- th- this was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, I think. I think uh, I had three three pieces that I really, really enjoyed. I just kind of want to list them out off the top. Maybe we can use them as like a jumping point. One, Viola Davis, who does dramatic roles so well, just going into action, fucking crushing it. Maybe the most predictable like uh, acting turn ever. But yeah, she's just great at everything she does. Uh, John Boyega? Getting like a great role. Uh, yeah, we, we seen he was him good. A few, yeah, the he king. was really good. And then... Uh, Lashana Lynch. Oh my you god. Post Star Wars just <laughs> fucking crushing it. I was just like, man, this is great. And then I I mean, this I guess is my fourth point, but do so uh Me- Me- Mebdu, the the child Nawi is just really really great as well. I think we're going to be seeing yeah. her a lot more moving forward yeah, but from the underground railroad, of course. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. What what was your general take on the Woman King? Yeah, I think the Woman Woman King is just epic. It's really great. It, it's it's a really fun it's a, it's a traditional conventional like swords and sandals action movie right it's very reminiscent of all kinds of classics like braveheart and gladiator and you know war movies stuff of that ilk you know it's just it, it it's a tried and true uh film format for a reason and in this case you have all this great talent surrounding it you have i think a really engaging yet coherent story which is just this this kingdom fighting for their survival as uh, everything around them is, is changing. Set in West Africa during the early 1800s, slave trade well underway at this point. And yeah, I thought it was just really great. And then really, I think it really kicks into high gear once, uh, you know, once the Agoji are training their new crop, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're new recruits. And that's where uh, Thuzo uh, Madubu comes in here and Lashana Lynch kind of takes her under her wing and gets to be that familiar figure, right? Of like the uh, elder kind of training you and, and showing you the ropes. But man, it's like the Lashana Lynch performance is, is, is honestly like really great. I think really carries so many of the, so many of the scenes because there's just so much charisma and, and fun energy there. But I think it's just, the Women King, just really solid film. Like it just goes through all these beats we know, but it just does it at such a high level, and you have such so much talent involved that it's just it's a really fun time. Yeah, yeah, I I couldn't agree more that the movie really takes off once you get the trainings going. Um, I think that's great. I love the the scene where they're uh, doing like the the competition. Kind of reminds you of like. Um, wonder woman when they do like the amazonian warrior like competition oh, yeah, sure. um, a bit and I, I think that is like a clear standout as well and you know i was really expecting this like huge huge battle to kind of be like the ending because that's kind of how these things go right there's usually like one like final epic battle and maybe it's, like people die but like having it be this smaller like rescue mission that kind of puts viola davis in this like position of do i disobey my king and you know go and save my my team or do i stick by with the king and know that some of my teams are going to be sacrificed i think it was really smart because i added this level of like this character having to kind of change or or make this decision that it was difficult while also like putting like these other characters apart to like let them grow and have their own moments and I, i don't know if there's going to be a woman king sequel i definitely could see one happening um and the way that they kind of leave things off i think there's a lot of potential for it but yeah it's it, i just was really impressed and and the action scenes are just dynamite like they're mm-hmm. they're really great and seeing like the different like battle styles you know we always kind of talk about that like things in like john wick or other action movies you it's easy to be like oh well you know he fought that way and this guy's this type of fighter but you really see like how the women in this like were using their size and their agility against these like more like lumbering 
sizable enemies. And I, I think it was mm-hmm. all just really cool to see how they, they kind of worked that out. Right. How did you feel about this plot once the uh, Europeans come into it? Because early on, I was watch, you know, I was going in, and I'm like, you know, I wonder if this is going to be solely African based. And then you see the time, and I'm like, okay, well, slave trade's happening, so odds are we're going to see. It. And they they don't run away from the presence of the slave trade right away. But then, like, the, I think the movie just a clear shift when we get it past the hardcore training stuff and into the fact that the traders are around and and kind of basically allying with like a neighboring. Uh, African state and you know shit's about to go down basically and that I really like that conflict they set up where it's like the kingdom of Dahomey under John Boyega's kingdom wants to move away from selling slaves themselves which is what they used to do in the past and that's a big part of what uh, uh, Viola Davis's uh, Nanisco wants to happen and you know then uh, Nawi meets Malik, right? The biracial guy who came over with the, the traders, and you know, like you said, the final battle, the rescue mission, we're taking place at like the port where all this, you know, the, the slavery, slave trade's happening, right? Yeah. So it's like we're kind, we kind of like leave the bush behind, and there's a lot more white people around. Um, how did you feel about like that kind of shift of the plot where it gets kind of much more high level, right? And it's mm-hmm. almost more about like the this kingdom's. Try, uh, fighting for its true independence and also right. like more like, ethical like finding its heart kind of thing I, I actually really liked that choice only because I, I think if you're going to put you know uh, the setting in West Africa at this point in, in history it's kind of hard to not have that be at least somewhat present um, and, I, and I think you kind of have inklings of that when some of these tribes have guns right and that kind of is what makes fighting them more challenging so you kind of know that there's european and potentially western world influence already kind of somewhere within this world um so then having it kind of show up and add this extra layer of you know danger this extra layer of like what is the story really about i think i i thought i added to the movie for me but i could also see how um if they had chosen not to introduce that and kind of just made it this like African story that's not touched by the European slave trade. Um, I, I think it could have still worked and, and been meaningful. It just wouldn't have had this extra layer of, of history. I think what, what was your opinion on it? Yeah. You know, I ultimately, I liked where it went, but like when it started happening and like now he's talking to Malik, I'm like, Hmm, where's this going to go? You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I like where it goes. You know, there's been a lot of talk um, online this weekend about, watching a movie about like the kingdom of Dahomey right and like there's a whole thing about like the historical accuracy and, and not just from like the usual like bad actors but from actual people that are like no like this is a movie about people that were slavers and you know it shouldn't support that kind of thing and I think you know on one hand it's like well most historical epics almost all of them will take liberties with yes. the truth that's just welcome to Hollywood it's not presented yeah. in a documentary and I think, if anything, this is clearly going to promote people to learn about this history, right? So I agree. It's completely, it's a net positive to me. I, like, it's not like we're laundering the reputation of anybody because this is hundreds of years ago. Like, this, we're not, we're not doing any like service to to bad actors or anything, right, of the past. But also, like, I think the movie, like, it, it like puts it front and center. It's like. Yeah, we used to sell slaves. Maybe they weren't our own people. We were still selling other Africans, and we want to stop that. And no matter how accurate that was, I think ultimately, like it's presenting that like in the open. Again, like the the slave trade is a huge aspect of the second half of the film, and you know, I think you know some people obviously like the less uh, credible types are just gonna look at it like, oh female warriors blah 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 but it's like no i think you know they they communicate all that that very well and the movie kind of i think rises even above and beyond that and it's like a really empowering thing but it's also just uh a bit more macro right when like how it's interfa- interfacing with the slave trade so i actually really came around on all of that by the end 
And again, it doesn't doesn't hurt when you have like Viola Davis and Lashana Lynch and John Boyega all like really killing it. Yeah, uh, I I I agree. I think um I I left wanting to learn more about it, and I and I hope other people do as well. But you know, it, kind of like most of these historical um or, or movies based on historical events or um, people, you can kind of take it at, at face value if you want. Just kind of enjoy this as a cool action movie, or you can really dive into the history i think it it all it works on multiple levels um yeah i mean it's it's uh it's kind of funny because like i don't really have a lot more to say about this only because i just thought it was like really great and really fun like totally a a surprise for me but like i i am really glad that i i saw watch this movie yeah (laughs) and and gina prince bathwood really stepping up after the old guard which was so so on netflix with charlize this is like a yeah movie that took some time to get made but yeah i mean to just get like a true honest to goodness like historical epic in this way looks great and it turns out it is great and uh yeah i was very pleased with it and i hope um the box office continues it had a pretty strong start and yeah. the movie actually is like pretty modestly budgeted it's like 50 million or something i was trying to think about that i was like well the thing with the sets like they built the the port and they built like the kingdom of Dahomey's palace. Yeah. Those are probably the only two permanent sets, right? And they must have done like some yeah. location stuff for the battles. So I guess you can you can kind of see how they maybe kept this this one in check financially. Yeah, save some money here and there. I I, I thought it looked really great still, you know, yeah. for what they built. Um, but yeah, pretty simple sets, like almost like the same setup too. You know, you think about the kingdom, uh, the the uh, temple, castle. And then the, the port, they're just kind of like these big encircled uh, yeah, areas. Cool. <laughs> right, these courtyards, basically. Yeah, so it's pretty simple, but it worked really effectively, for sure. Holly. All yeah. right, well, I think that does it for us this week. Dave, what do we got for next week? Yeah, so I think we have some really interesting stuff here for various reasons. Next week, we had music from Christine the Queens and Willow, Willow Smith. On Netflix, we're finally getting Andrew Dominic's Blonde, starring Anna de Armas, after a lot of... Uh, hype and anticipation disney plus first three episodes of andor the star wars rogue one prequel series and then uh at last after many a news cycle don't worry darling is coming out and darling we're worried <laughs> well <laughs> subscribe to youtube.com slash nostalgia pod check it out uh anyway you want to go to our twitter at nostalgia pod and follow the link tree and also subscribe to our nostalgia best of 2022 playlist on spotify catch you next week